I'm going to go over markdown format and then a very short markdown workflow. Um, I'm sorry, I did not have a whole lot of time to prepare. So it's essentially what Hadley has written. But I think that, you know, given that it's just like a survey of things, it should be sufficient. So um, this is just going to be a brief overview of some of the other types of output that we can make with Markdown. Um, we've seen it with HTML docs so far. And um, there are two ways to set the output of a document. So permanently by modifying this YAML header, and you can say, you know, title, output, HTML document, or transiently by calling um, uh, the art markdown package and function render by hand. So um, here's a call, diamond sizes, rmd is the markdown file and your output format okay so i didn't understand what he means by permanently or transiently like so what's the, the difference the first one is a setting for that document that that document will always quote unquote always render an html document okay. format at least by default and the mm -hmm. second one is like you just call the render function say hey oh. render this document in this format Ver and so if you do um, at the top of the screen where there's the knit button with the little arrow next to it, yeah. drop down arrow, if you click that drop down arrow and choose a different one, it's basically calling our markdown render mm. with that other format. Got it. So that okay. is doing that for you at that point. Okay, that makes sense. My knit is not working, but we'll, we'll get to that. Okay, so... Um, he says, this is useful if you want to programmatically produce multiple types of output, that makes sense. Uh, the knit button renders a file to the first format listed in its output field. So in this case, HTML, and then you can render to additional formats by clicking the drop down like we just did <laughs> and John told us about. Okay, so let's go over some output options. Um, each output format, now we know, right, is associated with an R function. Um, you can either write just the function or the package function. Um, if you omit the package, the default is assumed to be markdown, okay? Um, it's important to know the name of the function that makes the output because that's where you can get help. Uh, for example, if you want to figure out what parameters you can set for HTML document, then you do your question mark, you know, package function. Um, to override the default parameter values, uh, you need to use an expanded output field. Like for example, if you wanted to render this HTML with additional attributes, then you would use output, HTML, and then these two um, expanded outputs. So I'm not entirely sure what each, each of these does. I think these are features, right? Yeah, so okay. this view that you have in our studio is effectively those settings that it turns uh, on a table yeah, of contents yeah, yeah. and it makes a floating table of contents. So, oh, nice. Okay, so let's just. So that would be, it's yeah. It's not. Sorry. <laughs> this, right? Yeah. No, no, no. It's yeah. so, okay. Okay, yeah. I see that. Yeah. All yeah, right. you, uh, you're effectively doing that by having the visual Perfect. view. Um, That's actually good to know. Okay. <laughs> um, let me scroll back. Okay. So the first output type that we're going over is documents. So of course you can generate different types of documents like. PDF, um, so it makes a PDF with, how do you pronounce this? Is this latte? Because that's how I've heard it pronounced by a Norwegian friend. That's, so it's, that's that's actually probably even more correct. It okay. depends on how, how like, how pedantic you are. Okay. Latte. Or it's latex. I, I learned it okay. latex, so I say latte. The, the okay. X is technically a chi. It's a whole thing. Anyway, but yeah, it's the latex format or the latex format. Or the latte format, if you want to be really, really, really <laughs> <Okay>. fancy. <laughs> so anyway. that is a, a open source document layout system, right? Uh, which you will need to install. Um, and our studio will prompt you if you don't have it. You can make Word documents, um, ODT, open document text. What is, has anyone worked with these ODT documents? Are they, how are they different from words or just like a text or something? Uh, 
I don't think I've ever actually worked with ODT, but I've worked with previous open standards. It's just, you know, Microsoft owns the DocX format. Open D, D uh, yeah, yeah. or okay. ODT is a, a open source format. Got it. Okay. And then RTF rich text format, I'm assuming it's similar to this ODT. Yeah, it's a little, it's like um, basically text, but with some markup in it for bold okay. and italics and things like that. Mark. Got it. Okay. And then, um, of course, you can do a markdown document. Um, says this isn't typically useful by itself, but you might use it for your corporate CMS or lab wiki if they use markdown. Okay. And then also a GitHub document, which is just a tailored version of the markdown document that is designed for sharing on GitHub. So that's useful. Um, so it also says, you know, when generating a document to share with decision makers, which is a whole lot of the philosophy behind these markdown, like notebook things, uh, you can turn off the default display of code by setting the global options in the setup chunk. So set echo false. And then um, for HTML documents, another option is to make the code chunks hidden by default, but visible with a click. So code folding hide. Um, okay, so the next format is notebooks. Um, <clears throat> a notebook or HTML notebook is a variation on an HTML document. So the rendered outputs are gonna be very similar, but the purpose is just different, right? So an HTML document is focused on communicating with decision makers sort of like presentation or, you know, simplified where no one wants to see the code. And a notebook is focused on collaborating with other data scientists. So both will contain the fully rendered output, but the notebook also contains the full source code. Um, that means that you can use the .nb.html generated by the notebook in two ways. So you can view it in a web browser and you can see the rendered output, um, but unlike an HTML document, this rendering always includes an embedded copy of the source code that generated it, okay? And you can also edit it in RStudio. So when you open this type of file, um, RStudio will automatically recreate the .rmd file that generated it, okay? In the future, you will also be able to include supporting files like CSV data files, which will be automatically extracted when needed. Okay, that's interesting. So if you have supporting files, it gets sort of merged into this I don't, I, HTML? I haven't. I don't work with notebooks, um, yeah. and I do. I find it interesting. You know, anytime he has in the future in this book, you know, the book came out <laughs> uh, several years ago now. I don't know. I don't know where they went with that. I'm going to talk a little bit at the end that our studio pretty much just came out with a new format that is like mm -hmm. an upgrade to our Markdown. I would. It's oh. it's fine. Like keep learning our Markdown. People are going to still be using our Markdown. But I'll talk a tiny bit about the tiny bit that I know about the new format when we get okay. there. But good. the reason I want to bring that up is anything that says about, you know, eventually our studio is going to do this thing where they expand on our markdown. Yeah, at this point, they're probably not going to change our markdown at all because they came out with a yeah. new one. The, the, the quick intro is that they made like our markdown, but it doesn't require R. It's a... Um, fancy markdown format, but you could use it with Python and you can use it with SQL and you can do all these different things. Mm -hmm. And it also does all the things that our markdown does. To a large degree, it's just they improved our markdown and renamed it so that people who don't like R will use it. Um, um, <laughs> I see. Yeah. Anyway, so anything <laughs> that they talk about in the future, it'll do this. If it doesn't do it already, then it probably never will. Right. Right. Yep. Okay, I see. But Quarto probably does. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, it says, you know, you can share these notebooks. Um, you can email them, like files. So that's a simple way to share analyses with colleagues, but things will get painful as soon as they want to make changes. So it's time to learn Git and GitHub, which I did. I went to a workshop on Thursday and it was great. So um, I'm not sure if, um, so UC Berkeley has the D lab, is the data lab, and it's mostly based on, not based on, but focused for 
social sciences and humanities, but they have a ton of workshops. And I think their repos on GitHub might be public. So that's a good way to learn, you know, like they have things on just about everything, like geospatial things. Like I'll, I took a lot of their early, like our, you know, little workshops and they had one that was bash in Git that was fairly useful. So if you guys are interested, I can always give you a link. Not, not entirely sure that the repos are public, but um, it was a very condensed, very um, basic introduction to Git and GitHub, but I found it very helpful. Um. Yeah, two recommendations on that. I'm mm -hmm. typing it. I think that's the URL. Happy Git with R is a website slash book put out by Jenny Bryan um, okay. from our studio. She she was a um, teacher and uh, professor before she left academia to work at our studio, uh -huh. and she was a really good professor. She's like her way of teaching. I, I find really helpful, um, and so that's a good repo use okay. this the the package use this has a whole bunch of functions for dealing with git and github and for the well number one you need r i think it needs to be 3.6 or later so if you have r 3.6 or later um and the r studio that goes with it they kind of automate a lot of the git and github stuff to make it okay. less painful um okay. and then the last piece on that is Soon, when I get a, a chance, I'm going to put together a little, I don't know, mini book and probably like two or three videos about using Git and GitHub with the book clubs at R4DS. Yeah, because, that would be great. Yeah, because, you know, there are special formats and special things that we do um, that, you know, mostly for people watching this, go look for those videos. Hopefully they exist <laughs> by the time you're watching it. Um, because there are just a few things that if you learn how to do them, your life is better. And those things that we do for the book clubs are most of what you have to do in, in uh, GitHub. Like, you know, we're going to cover, I'm going to cover all the, the basics. The other side of that is Tan, uh, Tan Ho from um, R4DS had his talk accepted for our studio account this summer. And he's doing a talk about like deep into Git and GitHub. Okay. Um, all the fancy things that you might need or might want to do, might want to learn to make your life easier and better. So lots and lots of options are out there for getting GitHub. Um, you know, and definitely do share that course if you are, or the, you know, the repos if you're able. Um, yeah, I, I will just remind me and I will do that <laughs> in chat at the end. So the lab workshop. Um, Okay, um, I wanted to ask questions about Git and GitHub. Let's just say that towards the very end. Um, okay, it says, you know, learning Git and GitHub is definitely painful at first. Um, I'm sure we're all at different levels of that, <clears throat> but the collaboration payoff is huge. Um, there is not gonna be covered, but he says one tip that's useful is if you're already using them is you'll use both HTML notebook and GitHub document out. So then you have both of them. Um, <clears throat> the HTML notebook gives you a local preview, right? A file that you can share just via email. And then the GitHub document creates a minimal markdown file that you can check into Git. Um, right, okay. So then um, another output type, and this I was very excited about is presentations. Um, so this will give you less visual control than like with PowerPoint, right? Um, but automatically inserts the results of your R code into a presentation, and that can save a huge amount of time. Yes, that is very true. So the presentations work by dividing your content into slides with a new slide beginning at each first, um, what do you call those, hashes? Or second? Uh, hashes, hash marks. Uh, pound signs. Yeah, pound signs. Yeah. Whatever. Header, Little, header marks. In our header marks. And then you, or you can also insert a horizontal rule, a three asterisks to create a new slide without a header. Um, so it comes with three presentation formats that are built in. So iOS slides presentation, that's the HTML. Slidey presentation is HTML presentation. I don't know what this W3C slidey is, but- It's I the uh, World Wide Web Consortium is W3C. Oh, okay. Uh, slidey is like, I guess a standard 
uh, HTML presentation format. Okay. Um, I, oh. I can't remember where they go in this because again, this is oldish. Like those, all these still exist. Mm -hmm. um, and Reveal JS is something that people like a lot, but I think it's number two in the. Um, no. Okay. This book predates. There's a package, Sharingan, spelled like that. That is the modern R Markdown slideshow package. Um, all of these also work, but sharing in, like it has a function that you can just call the function in your R Studio and it'll constantly render your slides as you're working on them oh, and like show you okay. what they're going to look like. Um, also, I think it probably now has the live view in R, R Studio, so you don't even need that function anymore. Um, it's written by the guy who like wrote the book about R Markdown. Um, he is the R Markdown expert. But then, like I said, there's also the new format. Quarto has its own slideshow. Um, I mean, I think it, I don't know. I haven't learned it yet, but I, it, it, so lots of options for slideshows in right. R Markdown is the, um, the short version of that. Yeah, the, the, this would be really interesting to me. Um... But a lot of my graphs may not necessarily come from R. Sometimes they, you know, you just mishmash and it comes from other things. So I'd have to play around to see, um, either just to get it to work and or see how useful it, it is switching to completely like you know R-based presentation. Um, okay, then you can also make dashboards. And this I also found really cool. Um, it's a useful way to communicate large amounts of information visually and quickly. Uh, Flex dash Board makes it easy to create dashboards using our markdown and a convention for how the headers for how the headers affect the layout. So level one header begins a new page in the dashboard, level two header begins a new column, and level three header begins a new row. So let's run this example. So this was actually really cool. Um, this is just from the diamond data set. And here you have, you know, different uh, either histograms or bar charts. And then uh, here you have a little searchable table. Um, I don't know, I, I find this super, super cool. Um, I don't know if you guys use dashboards and it was fairly simple to make. So again, you have you know your level one or two headers to make the different columns. And then it's just essentially ggplots. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I was very impressed by this. I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, Flex Dashboard is a nice way to um, to really quickly get dashboards. Right. Uh, interact, you know, interactive Inter yeah. views yeah. up and running. Um, what is there's so there are the, kind of the two sides. There's Flex Dashboard, which is RMD. Um, really quick to build and then there's um uh, there's another package that i will put into the chat that is kind of the if you go more the shiny side um but it still helps you quickly build dashboards those two packages are really um useful and i will mm -hmm. pull up the other one while we're talking <laughs> awesome thank you um Okay, interactivity. So any HTML format, right? Like document, notebook, presentation, or dashboard can contain interactive components, which is really great. So um, HTML widgets is a HTML interactive format and you can take advantage of that interactivity with this package. Are functions that produce interactive HTML visualizations. So uh, for example, take the leaflet map below. If you're viewing this page on this on a web page, you can drag the map around, zoom in and out, et cetera. So this is a super cool feature. Uh, you obviously can do that in a book. So our markdown automatically inserts a static screenshot for you. So, you know, this is what it would look like and uh, you'd be able to click and just like drag and zoom in and out. Um, okay, that's cool. So yeah, it's just called shiny dashboard. I was trying to make it too hard on myself. Oh. What is what is that shiny dashboard format? I can't remember what it's. Yeah, it's just shiny dashboard. Um. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so 
the really cool thing about this HTML widget is that you don't need to know anything about HTML or JavaScript to use them. Um, so all of the details are wrapped inside the package, so you don't need to worry about it. And there are many packages like these listed here that provide HTML widgets. Um, I've heard about this diagrammer, but um, I've never actually used it. So, um, and then there, here's a link to learn more about HTML widgets. And then um, there's also Shiny. So HTML widgets provide client-side interactivity, like all the interactivity happens in the browser independently of R, okay. On one hand, that's great because you can distribute the HTML file without any connection to R. However, fundamentally limits what you can do to things that have been implemented in HTML and JavaScript. So an alternative approach is to use Shiny, which is a package that allows you to create interactivity using R code, but not JavaScript. So I wish Lucy were here because then she could, you know, um, talk to us a little bit about what she knows. Um, so to call shiny code from R Markdown, you just add runtime shiny to the header, and then you can use the input functions to add interactive components to the document. Um, so library shiny, text input, uh, name what is your name, and then let me just run this. So, uh, oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, yeah. OK. It's it's going to be a little weird in because you aren't working in one that yeah. has shiny turned on, yeah. um, and uh, like the thing to keep in mind with shiny, I don't know, it might mention that that um, mm -hmm. it makes deploying it much more complicated if okay if you're using shiny because you have to be running on a server that has the shiny server set up because you're running our code like on the server yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, okay okay but well then our studio has shiny apps.io is a um like place to deploy shiny apps um you can do okay. a limited number of deployments for free and then they have paid accounts um but it is like i do everything in shiny that i do that's interactive like you can do um you know, anything that exists on the web could be made in Shiny, like any interactive websites. So, um, yeah. <laughs> okay. I think I just need to familiarize myself better with, you know, like server side and or, yeah. you know, client side and, and like what that means in terms of like how you run these things, like the Shiny or Shiny server or whatnot. Yeah. Like if you just want it for yourself, I, I have made mm -hmm. things in Shiny just to run locally, but then you still have an interactive thing that you can, whatever, do things with. Yeah. Um, and it'll run locally, no problem. It's when you're trying to let other people see it that it gets complicated. Yes, yes, okay. I think that that's what he's talking about here, right? Yeah. So you can't show you a live yeah. Shiny app here because Shiny interactions occur on the server side, right? Okay, so yeah. this means that you can write interactive apps without knowing JavaScript, right? But you need a server to run them on. Mm -hmm. Um, this introduces a logistical issue. Shiny apps need a Shiny server to be run online. When you run Shiny apps on your own computer, Shiny automatically set up a Shiny server for you, but you need a public facing Shiny server. You want to publish this sort of interactivity online. Okay, that's the fundamental trade off of Shiny. You can do anything in a Shiny document that you can do in R, but it requires someone to be running R. Okay, and then you can learn more about Shiny at this link and or also join the book club. <laughs> okay, and then I think this is the last one, it's websites. So with a little additional infrastructure, you can actually use Markdown to generate a complete website. I think this is very cool. So you put your .rmd files into a single directory and then this index rmd will become the home page. Um, then you add a YAML file named, you know, uh, underscore site YAML that provides the navigation for the site, for example, like this. Um, okay, so name, navigation bar, title, your website left, and then you. I see. Okay, okay. I, I think I understand what that is. <laughs> Not entirely. Okay. Um, but yeah, so it's generated, it's, this website is made up of three. HTML files, and you know, one is going to have the home title, one has the Veritas colors title, mm, and one okay. string colors. And mm -hmm. 
um, it looks like it's going to be on some nav bar. So you'll be at my website and it'll show those three things on the nav bar. And okay. it figures that out from this YAML that you put onto the site. I see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for explaining <laughs> that. Um, okay. And then you would execute, you know, package our markdown function render site to build the site. A directory file is ready to deploy as a standalone static website, right? Or if you use an RStudio project for your website directory. <clears throat> um, RStudio will add a build tab to the IDE that you can use to build and preview your site. So meaning here on in RStudio? Uh, it would be, well, yeah, it would be, yes, it would be over in the build. And then also if it's set up this way, the little, the blue button in the R Markdown section, um, the blue circle thingy over to the, almost all the way to the right of the, the to the left, right, that. Okay. That, <laughs> if it is, if you have a website set up, then our, our studio says, oh, this is a website. Um, do you want to publish this? And it'll walk you through how to publish it to um, uh, not shiny apps in that case, but whatever to our studio's publishing platforms. Um, yeah, that, that's how they make our pubs. Yes, our pubs. Um, <laughs> which, you know, like they make all this easy. And the reason they make all these things easy is they charge for um, like the higher end publishing. Mm -hmm. um, if you need to have you know, um, user uh, logins and things like that, they can handle all that, um, which is, you know, it's, I love their business model because they're like, hey, we sell you the hosting and the, the parts that are hard. And mm -hmm. then meanwhile, I think more than 50% of their um, employee time is spent on open source stuff to make you want right. to use their yeah, yeah, services. Yeah. I see, um, I see. So, Interesting. you know, works for them and it works for us, so. Yay. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, to learn more, there's another link. You can go there. Um, and then there are additional other formats. Um, so <laughs> you can use Bookdown, right? Like we've been seeing throughout this uh, book club. Um, you can, this whole book was made in Bookdown. Um, Pretty Doc Package provides a lightweight document formats with a range of attractive themes. So I didn't have the time to look at that. And then the Articles Package compiles a selection of formats tailored for specific scientific journals. So I actually did take a look at that. Um, I'll show you one that I downloaded. This is a PNAS template. So PNAS is the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, very prestigious journal. And um, I was interested in this because oftentimes, um, when you write an article for a specific journal, obviously they have you know, their own bibliography and how they want sections formatted. Um, it's not such a hassle to do it, but it's when you get rejected and you have to reformat for a different journal. And sometimes you go through several iterations that this could become super, super helpful. Yeah. So um, if anyone is you know, into academic publishing, um, I think that you know, learning to use this, because they had several, um, formats available, but I think they also happen to be to very top journals. So <laughs> it's sort of like, if your work is not getting in there, then you're back to just, you know, either you create your own template or, you know, it's back to like manual. I think things. some of the, the um, less, you know, slightly lower tier journals, some of them will mm -hmm. explicitly use the format of a top tier journal. So if you can find out like what their what journal they're based on, that would give you a starting point yeah. at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. That's true. I've never you know directly compared, but I I don't know. Maybe it was just my luck. One manuscript was just oh my god, a nightmare to format and reformat. So, and nothing was the same. So no, of course not. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, so there's an additional tips for learning more. Um, just, you know, a general about effective communications in these different types of formats and Hadley recommends, you know, for improving presentation skills, there's this book, you can read that. Um, whoever needs to or wants to do that or for giving academic talks, uh, there's this leak group guide to giving talks. Um, 
Then there's one for public speaking or if you're creating a lot of dashboards and then um, effectively communicating your ideas. Um, and this is uh, some knowledge about graphic design. This actually might be interesting uh, in terms of like that with combining with a GG plots and or, you know, just making your visualizations better. Okay, so any questions on that specific topic or shall we just move on to the next one? I was just um, looking for that presentation patterns book, seeing mm -hmm. if he has a free online version because that's those kinds of books. Um, I want to find more of those to start doing book clubs of where it's not really R at all. It's just how yeah. to do, you know, it's useful skills mm -hmm. or, um, you know, online courses and public speaking, different things like that, that, that could be a, a neat book club to do. Um, the, the actual link in r for ds to, to Amazon fails right now for that book. Oh, so no. okay. I'll have to go digging a little bit more and see what's up with that. Um, I also know that uh, at least last year for our studio global, um, our studio actually provided professional presentation training to people who were giving mm -hmm. talks. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if that's going to become more and more of a common thing, but that is something to look out for that, you know, get in fact, get involved in something open source. So you have something to talk about or, you know, whatever, do research, do whatever, do a thing. So you have something to talk about mm -hmm. and then like a useful way to learn to be better at present giving presentations is get accepted by our studio to present and they will teach you how to do it because they want the, uh, the presentations to be quality um so yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah i think they're doing that again this year um i i'm giving a lightning talk so i will find out soon if oh, uh, nice. if they're gonna teach me how to do it better um yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um but yeah it's all definitely... these these things um mm -hmm. It's interesting. I know, I think Jeff Leak actually just left academia too. So I wonder if that one, if that link is active. Um, I could be wrong, but I think yeah. he did. But I'll bet his, yeah, his GitHub is still active. So um, yeah, cool. <laughs> Sounds, yeah, I, I was just wondering, you know, like um, how or what people might be giving presentations for. So like in academia, it's very common, like, and it's right. mostly PowerPoint presentations. So you present either like lab meetings or, you know, like the group meeting, the floor meeting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, there's definitely a, a skill to learn, but that's also very much tailored to like, I'm in, you know, biological sciences. And so there's a way to present for those sorts of things. And then, you know, everyone sort of follows the same format to some extent. There is no, not a lot of deviation from. There like are, typical... yeah, there are some, like, I, I'm really interested to look into this presentation patterns book mm -hmm. because I think they're talking about, um, like, even though the content and even the style might be very different, but the idea of, um, like, the presentation that's more of a story versus the presentation that is just pure like facts that you're trying to get out versus you know there are like these types of presentations that i could see um possibly being a thing i do know mm. uh, one thing i heard last year about um the advice that people were getting was finding a like a story to frame your presentation in so that it's more of a it has a beginning, middle, and end, and there's um, characters, and there's a plot that it you know there's characters that change along the way. Whether you know your character might just be um, your package, you know, and telling the story mm -hmm. of how your package mm -hmm. came to be or whatever. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I'm interested to see uh, how that goes. If again, I don't know if I'm going to get uh, training in how in for my five minute lightning talk. But then again, lightning talks are actually really hard <laughs> because you only have five minutes. Sure, exactly. Yeah, I guess yeah. the format, the tougher it is. Um, yeah, because you have to be very concise. So, um, but yeah. The, okay, let's anyway. go on to this yes. other 
part, um, in case anyone was not interested in presentations, which I am. Um, <laughs> okay, so this is a very brief, just arc markdown workflow. Um, I think earlier we discussed a basic workflow for capturing our code when you work interactively in the console and then you capture what works in the script editor. So I don't remember exactly <laughs> when we did this or I usually don't work on the console. I will just yeah. type everything out on in the editor. So I think it was but, chap chapter six. Um, okay. So it's been a while. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> so I think that uh, what he was talking about here is just that the benefit of our markdown is that you can have both, right? It's the console and the script editor. Um, so it blurs the lines between just interactive exploration and learn long-term code capture because you can just iterate within a chunk, edit it, you know, once you're happy, you save it, you move on to another chunk, right? And so um, another benefit is that uh, Markdown will integrate pros and code, right? So it makes it a really great analysis notebook or tool because it lets you develop code and then also record your thoughts. And so he's giving here the sort of like analogy that an analysis notebook is very similar to a classic lab notebook in the physical sciences, this is true. So um, we're just gonna go over a few tips. So essentially, in a notebook, in a, our markdown file, you can record what you did and why you did it. And so regardless of how great your memory is, if you don't record what you do, you know, there will always come a time when you've forgotten what it was that was important. And so you should just write down the details so you don't forget them. Um, this also helps you uh, support, you know, more rigorous thinking. So for example, you're likely to come up with a strong analysis if you record your thoughts as you go and then continue to reflect on them in sort of an, an integrated fashion where you just have everything there available, right? And this will save you time when you eventually write up your analysis to share with others, right? Um, it will help others understand your work, right? So it's rare to do data analysis by yourself and you'll often be working as part of the team. And so with this lab notebook, you can share not just what you've done, but also what you did with your colleagues or, or lab mates. Um, so this is uh, just good advice about using lab notebooks effectively. And he got these guidelines from his own experience and then this Colin Perrington's advice on actual physical you know, lab notebooks. Um, so I just put down some of the tips. Um, you should make sure that each notebook has a descriptive title, right? Uh, a file name that you can remember and it helps you organize things. And also a first paragraph that briefly describes the aims of the analysis. That actually makes a lot of sense. Um, use the YAML header date to record the date you started working on the notebook. So this is very true. Like for lab entries, you have to have a date on whatever it is, and then you record diary style, you know, what you did. Um, so he's recommending this ISO 60, 8601 year, month, date format so that there's no ambiguity, right? Use it even if you don't normally write dates that way. Um, yes, I, I do agree. Uh, sometimes you don't wanna go back and then not know exactly what date that was. Um, if you spend a lot of time on analysis, right, an idea, and it turns out to be a dead end, like don't ever delete it. So you write up a brief note about why it failed and leave it in the notebook. And that will help you avoid going down the same dead end when you come back to the analysis in the future. Yes. So with lab notebooks, you never delete, remove pages or scratch anything out. You just cross it and say why it didn't work. And then you have a record, you know. I will say for- order. For for an R markdown notebook mm -hmm. or or whatever R markdown file, I do have times where like I'll have a whole big giant block of code, mm -hmm. and I don't delete the idea, but I don't like okay. don't need the giant block of code. I can say, hey, look, this is what I tried. Here's a summary of it. Mm -hmm. Don't go down that road because it didn't work because of X Y Z. Like replace the code with words about the code. With, yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, it's not exactly the same philosophy as an, a lab notebook, but the same idea. Um, I mean, you can just say eval equals false, D you know, don't run this code. Right, um, right, right. But if it's, you know, like if I feel like it's gonna be too distracting for it to be there, I'll slice it out and just say why it's not there anymore. But right, right. I do agree sense. with yeah. like conceptually don't delete it, like mention the dead end and why it was a dead end. Um, because that's super useful 
you know, even if you're not working with anyone, you're working with future you and future you does not have mm -hmm. a perfect memory of what you tried. Um, and I've had that like <laughs> I had I've had multiple times where I'll start to like reduce. I'm like, why didn't I do this? And then I find the note mm -hmm. where I'm like, oh, I did do that and it didn't work. That's why I didn't yeah. do that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Exactly. I, I think, you know, as long as you're organized and you find the system that works for right. you, like, like you're saying, you know, if, if a code chunk is just ginormous and you're like, I don't want to see this, <laughs> then just write down like what you did, why it didn't work yeah. so that you don't redo it. Um, that makes sense. Okay. So he says, you know, generally you're better off doing data entry outside of R. Okay. But if you do need to record a data snippet, you can just uh, lay it out using the tibble, tribble function. Um, it says, if you discover an error in a data file, never modify it directly, but instead write code to correct the value. Okay, this I, I found really interesting. That actually made a lot of sense, meaning you're not modifying your raw data, right? right. But you're correcting it within the notebook that you're working with. It, okay. Depending on the, um, like, wh where you are in a an organization or whatever, that can also be, hey, tell someone, um, if the data is being generated wrong, like it's being saved wrong from by some system or something, mm -hmm. try to get it fixed at the source, but don't fix it just in your copy, you know, because then it's not actually fixed. And the next time you that, pull yeah. that data down, yeah, it's yeah, going to yeah. be broken. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I see. I see. That, that makes sense. Okay. Um, he says, you know, before you finish for the day, make sure you can knit the notebook, which I cannot. I don't know why my knitting is no. not working, but um, it says if you're using caching, then make sure to clear the caches and that will let you fix any problems while the code is still fresh in your mind. Yes, this is true. Um, so I, I do agree with that, except usually the last thing I do in the day mm -hmm. is um, put like stop and a message of what I was thinking on or thinking about oh. or working on right then. So that if I try oh. to knit it the next day, I explicitly get an error message saying, no, I'm not done with this. Um, oh, okay. This is what yeah. I was thinking. So I, I actually like purposefully make it break at the end of the day. So I don't lose track of what, if I'm not done, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, if I'm in the middle of something, right. I just note what I was working on and what I was thinking. Like sometimes that's, the error, you know, quote unquote error message will be like a paragraph and a half or something. I just stream of consciousness or whatever, you know, write down, this is what I'm working on. This is what I'm thinking about. This is what I know I have to fix. Things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Th oh. That's actually a, a good tip <laughs> to, uh, as a reminder, because sometimes I'm just like, well, should I put a sticky off of my desktop and say, you know, this is what I was working on. Okay. Yeah. Um, it says, if you want your code to be reproducible in the long run, right, so you can come back to run it next month or a year or a few years, you'll need to track the versions of the packages that your code uses. Yes, so this is super important. So a rigorous approach is to use PackRat, um, which stores packages in your project directory or this checkpoint, which I think I will look into, which will reinstall packages available on a specific date. So I think that this is super cool. Um, I've had a project where I had to go and look for an archive version of a package and then install all of the dependencies by hand. That was a nightmare. So um, in, in that case, I had to do it because you know it was a package that I wanted to use. Uh, it wasn't something that I had used years ago that I had not saved, but I can see how this could become um, very helpful so that you're not wasting time reinstalling. Like either old packages or different versions of packages. Um, so I, I put a note in the in the chat. There's a newer package, Pack P A K, that is kind of the replacement of Packrat. Um, okay. It's same idea, but it, it deals with all the package versioning stuff, so that you um, don't get stuck. Like, because I have definitely had that where oh something changes right. in one package. And it's, you know, okay, yeah, it's better now, but my code expects the old version. And so, yes, um, yeah, dealing with that is definitely a thing. Um, and then there's also the package slash like system targets, which um, I haven't used and apparently I should. Everyone loves targets. 
Um, okay. It is, a is, way is of, it the same as PECRIT or PEC? Uh, it is a whole system that includes, I think, I think it probably uses PAC. I'm not sure. Okay. It'll like, it keeps track of what parts of your code have run already. And if like it, what, what things rely on. So if something up top changes, anything that relies on that change, it knows to rerun those pieces, but not rerun all the pieces that don't rely on it. And it, it's like this whole thing to let you, um, kind of keep track of everything and not, you know, because sometimes there will be code that takes hours to run. Right. Don't rerun that if you don't have to. And so it's all, it's that. It's all the um, keeping things organized in that way. We do something else at work, but um, targets might be, like we might have kind of over-engineered around something that people have already sorted out. So um, I, I do recommend okay. looking into that. I Like I say, I don't use it, but everyone tells me I should. <laughs> Okay, hold that thought because I'll finish these two sentences and then I wanted to ask you something. About okay. That. So a quick and dirty hack is to include a chunk that just runs your session info, right? Um, just to know exactly what packages you were mm -hmm. running on that session. So it won't easily recreate your packages, you know, as they are today, but at least you will know what they are. Um, so yes, that's very helpful. Um, and then you're going to create many, many, many analysis notebooks over the course of your career. Just think of a way to organize them so you can find them again in the future. And so Hadley recommends storing them in individual projects and then just coming up with a good naming scheme. So I think that that's what I tend to do, just run individual projects. But within that, I still need to organize myself. So I am I am working on that. Um, OK, so did anyone have any questions? That is the end of this last section of the book. So yay. I'm going to stop share. So um, again, like it's better to use one of these uh, trackers, but there is um, the function dev tools install version will um, like at least try to install a specific version of a given package. Um, it, it has like, you know, read the help on that. If you ever need a specific version of a package, that is a way to help you um, deal with that. Uh, but again, it's better to use a whole system. Um, and I'm trying to see, it's actually from something else apparently. Uh, it's from remotes. Um, so uh, anyway, you can see the help if you go to um, this. Um, again, you have to install, you know, remotes or the dev tools. De dev tools is a wrapper package around some other packages. And in this case, the package that's wrapping is remotes. Um, so like they give an example, uh, this would be the type of call you do where you say, I want dev tools and it has to be at least version 1.12 and it can't like 1.14 is where it breaks. So don't, so use any version between 1.12 and 1.14. Um, it's really handy to be able to do that. Like I said, it's better to use a manager, a package manager of some sort that is like pack that's keeping track of exactly what versions you used. And it, it like stores those versions for you. So you have it, you know, those go with your project basically. Um, yeah, that's it for yeah. that. <laughs> okay. Um, Federico, what is package snap? That, that's another package for dealing with um, packages uh, versions. So okay. I had a, yeah, I had an issue because um, I have an old version of our studio and mm -hmm. uh, I have updated all the packages, included some packages that I, I shouldn't have uh, to be updated because of my version of our studio. So mm -hmm. I had to, um, go back uh, and check which one they were <laughs> not um, those. Yeah, so uh, that, that package helped me a lot. So apparently I solved the problem, uh, but see, not completely. Uh, what does is make a picture 
release all the version of your packages in the, in the, in your VR studio, and then mm -hmm. takes a picture uh, and uh, restore the previous versions. Oh, I see. Yeah, you can look at the documentation. There's an example on the internet that you can uh, just follow through the steps and it works. So this is, um, it's one of the, the many older package managers that like the team who made this um, worked on the PAC package, P-A-K. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, if you have an older system, sometimes you have to use older things. And so that's kind of, kind of what this is all about. You know, that's why um, it's why these package managers exist. But it's interesting to look oh. at the list of contributors on this. Um, most or all of them now work at our studio and work on <laughs> the pack package. So um, if yeah. you're starting scratch and you have a brand new system and you know, or whatever you have uh, up to date are in our studio. I would recommend pack, but there are lots of situations where, you, for one reason or another, that won't work. Um, right. I didn't. I didn't found this uh, because I haven't read this book uh, in particular this <laughs> chapter. Uh, so now I know that there are uh, two packages. But searching on the internet, the the other one came up. So. Yeah. Right. Yeah, there, there was, this is one of those things where there was a flurry of people trying to solve the problem, I don't know, three or four years ago, and then they kind of met, and they were like, hey, let's make one solution that's really good, and that's what PAC is. Again, I don't actually use PAC, I should use PAC, but I don't, um, but that's the one that everyone says is great, and so um, we do all kinds of other things to deal with it, and it's, it, it's the same thing of we kind of rolled our own solution and so that's what we use now because that's where we are one of these days i'll update to just use pack um because everyone the pack and targets those are the things to keep everything smooth um i have a question on this target like have, have you um used snake make or heard of snake make uh i have heard of snake make and i think let me um is yeah uh i think it's some i think it's related so let's it see. seemed in principle similar to what you're saying that the targets does because snake make also you know will uh i don't know i guess it's like a workflow pipeline manager but it also you know will check for for example if an analysis depends on a specific data table but the data table is updated yeah. then it will run that but if it, the data table has not changed, then it will not run. The yeah. Analysis, so. so I think I think SnakeMake is the Python equivalent oh. of targets. That's the okay, Snake. This is useful. Snake okay. Make. Um, yeah. There was something before targets. Let's see if I can find. Um, I can't find it real quick. The guy who made targets made something before targets. Um, I'm seeing if I can find that real quick. So you might hear about Drake. There it is. Drake. Um, Drake is, I don't remember what the D is, like data, R, make, something like that. Oh, okay. So Drake was his package before targets that was more equivalent to snake make. And then he kind of rewrote it all, made it easier to work with. And that's targets. Okay. Um, and yeah, like I said, targets is the one that of all the packages that I'm like, yeah, I should really learn that it is number one, I think of, yeah, I should really learn targets. Everyone loves targets. Um, okay. So if you're just kind of just getting started in using um, our markdown workflows or mm -hmm. otherwise like our um, data pipelines and things start with targets, <laughs> like that's what everyone eventually recommends that everyone eventually move to so i see uh, yeah maybe i, I here, will look into the... that um they have a nice uh package down website oh that was another one that wasn't in this list because it's newer oh. than the book there's a package called package down um i think it's that which if you work on open source packages it's a 
package to build documentation, like an online documentation website for your package. Um, in the same way that book down is made for books, package down is made for package documentation. And it makes a nice, like if, if you load that page, uh, the, the targets page, that format mm -hmm. is the package down format. And you'll see that like there's, um, was it tidy models? Oops. Not tidymiles.org, but if I go to a specific, um, I'm trying to, to load up an, another example because you'll see um, all these all these packages have these websites that look really similar. And it's because, yeah, okay. So it's not, yeah. it's a different format, but if we look at this, notice that there's like get started, reference articles, change log. Um, and I think targets had either the same uh, functions overview. Eh, it's not exactly the same, but it's the same idea, like the same general format of the website. Anyway, okay. um, so that is a an, another R Markdown format that has become popular. Uh, is the package down format? Package down. So, yeah. um, did you put the? I didn't. Link okay. in this? Sorry. Let's make sure that I have it right. And of course, you can go to the package down package down site, which is okay. that. <laughs> so that's a site about package down generated using package down. <laughs> Um, nice. Okay, and let anyway. me just put in the link to the D Lab. So the D Lab uh, oh, at Berkeley great. is probably the main repo. Hopefully, you guys can access it. I'm not entirely sure. I uh, I can. So perfect. Awesome. So I should get workshop. Great. I think that at the moment, you know, like the live workshops are only for like Berkeley affiliates. I wish, you know, they had more capacity to include everyone. Um, it's a very, very friendly place, which is why I ended up there. Um, and their motto is, it's okay to not know. So, you know, no question nice. is ever dumb or anything. So, yeah. Yeah, it looks like they do have links out to um, Software Carpentry. Uh, which is an organization that does um, mm -hmm. teaching, like software teaching. Uh, their classes, or they have um, uh, workshops on Bash and um, version control. Um, so cool. Yeah. So. So yeah. So that we is made it. it. I know. I will. Get on so I can actually see you guys. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Oh. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's exciting. Um, yeah. So, you know, like I did the, the thing last week of all the other options. Um, and then, you know, like maybe I might have to, maybe I'll do the build a career in data science club next. It'll be a little bit, but. That's a good one to have. Um, it'll be interesting. Like, I'll bet the videos we make for that club will have a lot of watches, more so than people redoing the club. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. Um, you know, but it depends what you want to do. We have all the clubs. Um, you can be like Federica and just do all of them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to be like Federica, but I don't know if I can. <laughs> Me too. Uh, Ryan also is doing pretty much all of the clubs. There are a few people who are going through. I mean, it's great. There are a lot of good books out there. Uh, it depends what you want to do. And there is a lot to be said for kind of sampling. You know, do a little bit in different books mm -hmm. until you find what you want to do. Um, there's no no harm in starting a book club and not sticking with it. Um, I wouldn't necessarily like advise you to try to do that, but I would advise you to try book clubs that you're not sure if it's for you and um, you know it's your time. So don't keep going just because you feel obliged. Uh, we often like this club started with I don't know 10, 10 or fifteen people I think. Um, I learned recently that apparently four 
is the exact perfect size for a group. Um, three and five are fine, but four is the size where people will actually talk to each other and not not over talk. Like it's not too many people where people can't uh, hear each other. It's not too few right. where one person has to like, uh, I don't know, like where it's too much work. So it's fine. We, we drop down to four by the end and really six, but um, really, yeah, that, that yeah. is true. Yeah. So okay. anywhere in that range is fine, but you know, be one of those 15, be one of the people who starts the club and hmm. uh, fades out. That's fine. Uh, it's always, I don't know. It's always interesting to me to, to watch the new clubs and you get a lot of people who are like, oh yeah, this is, this is a great idea. And then you get a couple chapters in and it's like, oh no, this is, <laughs> I don't want to read this book. Um, right. It's fine to do that. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Anyone have anything else to, to talk about? <laughs> I want to say, oh, it was no, go for really it. Go nice for it. meeting you all. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> for my first book group, this was really cool. I, yeah my first book club too. yes yes my first book club and it, yeah definitely i i've enjoyed it a lot and i think it was you know the the content and definitely the people that made me stick through it so awesome yeah i'm seeing um i had notes from our Thank very you. first meeting oh sorry go ahead federica I would say thank you because um, that that has been a pleasure to to meet you uh, all of you. Uh, so that is always interesting to have more to learn, and I, as well as John, I suggest you to do more book clubs <laughs> because uh, you can even jump in within uh, a started book clubs and see the things as as the same as he said. It's it's very interesting and you meet people and you learn things. If you want to tell the other what you learn, you can tell, you can ask questions. So it's a good thing. Yeah. I agree. Federica, what book clubs are you in? I'm just curious. Um not not, very, not, not that many. So <laughs> after up <laughs> just like ten. <laughs> I'm doing uh, Introduction to Statistical Learning, ISLR, Book Club. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that that's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, and I've started Statistical Rethinking, but then I've just dropped it mm. immediately because uh, they, they were advanced. So they, they were doing just the exercises. So I needed uh, to go back to the theory. And maybe yeah. I'll do that. Later, uh, within time when I finish this too then I have some plans so I don't know if I'll be able to uh, like set up a portfolio I've already mm. made um, uh, so a blog with our studio that's interesting so, uh, so I've been helped a bit but uh, it's interesting then you can store all, all the things that you do right and yeah. that's it so, yeah. nice. You inspire me to do more things. Actually, all <laughs> of you do. So this is good. <laughs> well, and you've, you've done a club. So the other thing you can do now is um, if there's a book you want to read, volunteer to facilitate, and then the club will, will exist. Um, that, yeah, that is true. Know. I think maybe once I go through ISLR, and I think I may redo this R4DS. Like, yeah. I have to be honest. And I, I, I suggest you... So. Yeah, I suggest yeah. you to do tidy models as well, and ggplot2, <laughs> and mastering shiny, <laughs> and so whatever it is. But, uh, you know, uh, I think tidy models is very good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you are already at knowledge of all the other possible uh, models to use with uh, uh, in machine learning, because ISLR yeah. is more machine learning than simple uh, statistical tests. So right. it's advanced. Uh, yeah. Okay. I think, yeah, I, I do think, I go back and forth in this, but I think I recommend ISLR first as a way to learn all the different types of modeling. And then tidy mm -hmm. modeling with R is more about, like it assumes you know 
how to model and it's showing you like how to code it in a nice clean setup. Um, mm -hmm. probably, they do overlap. Like I want to take them just in a loop, you know, read T tidy modeling and then read ISLR and then reread tidy modeling and then probably reread ISLR and implement it more in tidy models. Like they, they definitely kind of go back and forth. Um, Unfortunately, like I said, I, I kind of want to do like a baby version. Like ISLR is already the toned down um, ESL. Uh, uh, I can't remember. Explanatory statistical. No, something statistical learning. I can't remember what ES, E stands for. The same authors or two of two or three of the authors of ISLR wrote a more advanced book. And then ISLR is that book without all the like how to build your own prediction engines. And I think there needs to be one that's even lower that is just kind of here are the model types so that you know what they are, but we're not going to go through the math of how they work and we're not even probably going to code them. We're just going to talk about what they are and then take tidy modeling because what happens is ISLR teaches you how to code them and then tidy modeling says, well, yeah, but do it this way. It's easier. And so like you learn it twice kind of. Um, I don't know. I don't have a good answer there yet. ISLR is really good about learning what can be done with machine learning. Um, and then tidy modeling is how to do it. I think that's the way to look at it. And so I would say when you're reading ISLR, I don't think it's important to really, really dive into the code in ISLR because then when you read tidy modeling with R, you're gonna re-implement the same things in a different way anyway. So worry about the code when you do tidy modeling, worry about the concepts when you're doing ISLR, I think. I don't know, whatever, read all the books. <laughs> I, I wanna do tidy text, um, what is that? Uh, text mining with R. Um, I wanna do supervised machine learning for text analysis with R. Those are two of the books that I'm probably going to do next, but I also mm. kind of, I want to redo Advanced R because um, we, that was the very first one that we did uh, in the new format and I want to kind of update it. Um, I want, I want to read all the books. <laughs> Is Advanced R very advanced? Fairly, it's fairly advanced. Okay. Um, it's, not useful. I don't think it's useful if you're not writing code for other people. I see. Okay. Um, probably. There's, I mean, it's really useful. It's, there's, if you really, like, if you code a lot, Advanced R will make your code better. Mm -hmm. Like, the, the hesitation I have is future you is another person. And so your code will work better for future you after you read Advanced R. But if it's just for future you, eh, it's not necessarily as worth worthwhile to like build in error handling and to um, the other part is like a lot of times you don't care about efficiency in your code. Like mm -hmm. if it can run twice as fast, but it takes you half a year to learn to do that, um, that's not necessarily useful, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just yeah, take yeah. take twice as long. Big deal. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know. I'm torn on that. Um, if you really like writing R code, it is a useful book to learn because then, you know, maybe you aren't currently writing R, for, R code for other people, but you mm -hmm. could, you know. So, um, and that is why that one, like, I, I really like to write R code. And so getting that one nailed down even better, I know that my R code's not perfect. So learning a little bit more wouldn't hurt. Mm -hmm. um, but I also really like doing natural language processing. So reading those books would probably be useful. Um, right. Yeah. I also like making shiny dashboards, but I mostly just do that for R4DS. I don't do it at work anymore. So I don't know. <laughs> it's There's so much. The, I, that, that is the thing. Yeah, I, I yeah. do feel just like there's so much, you know, like where to start? I guess just go with uh, what is most useful and maybe what you most want to do so that it also makes it fun um, yes and you know the other thing is just uh whatever starts next 
join join yeah. a club like yeah. uh I'm about to announce another ISLR cohort. Um, I'm waiting for Kevin to choose a time out of, there was a tie for first. So whichever time works. Oh, okay. Um, it looks like it'll be Sunday or Monday. Uh, Sunday? Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There were a lot, it was Sunday and Monday were very okay. together. There were lots of times on both days and uh, okay. uh, the most people chose that. But also there were a lot of people who voted and um did, you know aren't available in those times so there will probably be a cohort mm. of six soon after that yeah. yeah yeah um yeah anyway uh, i don't mean to just kind of prattle on for the end of the club but uh find another club i you know obviously this was enjoyable enough that we made it through almost a year of going almost through a year club. i i know right yeah july end of july last year um and then uh keep going you know there's always stuff to learn um as i said last week if you have another book that as long as it's free online suggest it if you're willing to run the club then we'll do it um <laughs> and i guess with that i won't see everyone next week but i'll see you I on know, slack yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll see you on slack for sure um, or a different book club yeah and yeah i'm sure we'll see each other in other clubs um Alrighty. you can always find uh, you know just join any club and federica will probably be there so <laughs> you can see her <laughs> so, all right all right thank, thank you, you. Bye. It was a pleasure bye, bye. thanks